Hi, I'm David Kadish. I'm terribly sorry that I couldn't be physically with you today to present our paper on niche differentiation, but I'm hoping that, like the digital model of the soundscape that we're discussing, the virtual copy of me will still be effective. That, of course, is the raucous soundscape of a jungle. Not every environment has such a lively background course, however. Some, like this waterfall soundscape, are dominated by a single overpowering source. We are interested in the formation and the structure of soundscapes. Why do animals make particular types of sounds? How do new additions to the soundscape induce changes in the existing species? Since the conception of soundscapes and the eventual formation of soundscape ecology as a field, much of the work that has been done to answer these questions has been an observational fieldwork. This work's important, but we wanted to approach the problem more rapidly and experimentally, and artificial life simulations provided a way of going about that. For the remainder of this talk, I'll spend a little bit of time introducing some background material on soundscape and soundscape studies. Then I'll take you through the development of our virtual soundscape. And finally, I'll show you the results of our study on niche differentiation using our virtual environment. Within the study of soundscapes, soundscape ecology is the application of ecological concepts and theories to the auditory domain. For example, the acoustic niche hypothesis adopts the ecological theory of niches and applies it to the sounds that animals make within an ecosystem. This is the hypothesis that we're going to be testing in our computer model, so I'll spend a little more time explaining what it means. In landscape ecology, niche differentiation describes how species within the same physical space tend to use different resources in order to minimize competition. The canonical example of this is Darwin's finches, which, over the course of many generations, developed a diverse array of beak structures, which allowed them to make use of a wide range of food sources. Bernard Krauss proposed that this type of niche differentiation occurs in the soundscape as well. Animals, he proposed, tend to partition the soundscape so that as much as possible they have exclusive use of a particular frequency band and timings. John Edler further suggested that the driver of this change is sexual selection, or the ability of an individual to communicate with its potential mates. This is the theory that we've chosen to test. We wanted to know if it was possible to demonstrate this differentiation of acoustic signals driven by mate selection in a simplified, simulated soundscape. I should mention at this point that we are not the first to attempt to study these types of phenomena in an A-Life setting. At last year's edition of this conference, Alice Eldridge and Chris Kiefer proposed the idea of synthetic acoustic ecology. In that paper, they examined how the acoustic niche hypothesis leads to the structuring of acoustic spaces in ways that are detectable by acoustic biodiversity metrics. One of the innovations of this study is that we've used a highly simplified discrete model of a sonic environment, in place of the full-spectrum soundscape used by Eldridge and Kiefer. Studies of the full spectrum are important, but we proposed here that a simplified model can speed up and simplify the study of some of the system dynamics without a loss of integrity. So, without further ado, let's examine our soundscape model. This is a spectrogram, which soundscape ecologists often use to visualize their recordings. The vertical axis indicates the measured frequencies, and the horizontal axis tracks time. The coloring shows the intensity of the measured sound at a given frequency and time. The first simplification that we make is the discretization of the audio spectrum. Frequency bands are often used in acoustic ecology to measure differences in signaling, where signals are measured in terms of their power within a range of about 1000 kHz. We have adopted this logic throughout our model so that sounds are modeled as a signal strength in one of nine available bands. In order to focus on the spectral effects of the acoustic niche hypothesis, we made our second simplification, which was to eliminate timing effects from the model. In practical terms, 
This means that every sound is modeled as a single, instantaneous emission, in which occurs independently of other sounds. It is heard without interference by every individual in the system. The sounds, in effect, are treated serially instead of in parallel, which allows us to greatly simplify the computation and analysis for each signal. This diagram shows the experimental setup for a system containing two species, which is used in the experiments that I'll describe later on in this talk. Each species consists of a population of senders and a population of receivers that co-evolve with one another. The individuals of the species are modeled using NEAT, neuroevolution of augmenting topologies, which allows them to begin with a simple neural network structure and evolve complexity as needed. The goal of each species is to find a set of messages which can be decoded by members of its own species while ignoring messages from others in the ecosystem. The simulation proceeds as follows. A sender from species A processes one of eight possible messages through its neural network. This results in a set of signal strengths on the nine available audio bands which is passed into our virtual soundscape. This message is heard by every receiver from both species A and species B as though it were a sound projected into the ecosystem. The receivers from both species process this message through their own neural networks and determine whether the message originated from a member of their own species and, if so, attempt to identify the original message. For senders, Fitness is determined by the proportion of messages that are identified and decoded by receivers of their own species. For receivers, fitness depends both on their ability to determine whether a message originates from a member of their own species, and also on how well they've decoded the original message. That process is a little bit complicated, so let's take a look at an example. One of the 50 sender individuals from species A prepares to send a message. The message originates as a 3-bit code that is input to the individual's neural network. The network has evolved using a process called NEAT, the neuroevolution of augmenting topologies. This process evolves a genome which encodes the structure and weights of connections in a neural network. In these simulations, the individuals begin as randomly connected neural nets with only input and output layers, but NEAT allows them to evolve hidden layers and connections in order to add complexity to the vocalizations. The output of that individual's neural network is a string of nine floating point numbers that represents their vocalization in each of the nine available audio bands that make up our simplified soundscape. The vocalization enters the soundscape where it is received by each of the 50 receiver individuals in the receiving populations of both species. Each receiving individual undergoes roughly the reverse process as the sender. Its neural network, which has also evolved using NEAT, receives the vocalization as a string of nine floating point numbers and outputs four bits, the three message bits, plus a bit indicating whether it believes the message is from a mem member of its own species. Based on the receiver's responses, the fitness of the sender and receivers are calculated. The sender's fitness depends on how many receivers from species A correctly identified that the message was from a member of species A, and how many correctly identified the message itself. We can think of these messages like a bird's mating call. If nobody that you are trying to mate with can tell that you are trying to call them, then your chances of mating are going to suffer. The fitness of the receivers from species A is similarly formulated. They are rewarded for identifying and understanding their potential mates, and penalized for misidentifying a potential mate as a member of another species. The fitness of receivers from species B, however, depends only on whether they can identify correctly that the message is from another species, and therefore of no interest to them. This system, as described, is what we use to test our alternative hypothesis, or H1. This is the hypothesis that the need to identify which calls are coming from one's own species does indeed cause vocalizations from different species to diverge. A slight modification to the system is needed in order to test the null hypothesis, that the need to identify which calls are coming from one's own species does not cause vocalizations from different species to diverge. In order to test the null hypothesis, we assume that receivers already know which species is sending each message. 
Therefore, we remove the component of the fitness function that rewards the identification of the sender, and we only show receivers messages from their own species. To test these hypotheses, we ran simulations 20 times under the assumptions of both the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. The simulations were run for 300 generations of 50 individuals each. This image is a spectrogram for species A and B of one of the alternate hypothesis simulations, where the receivers received messages from senders of both species and had to identify the species of the sender. The vertical axis shows the nine frequency bands that the senders emit sound to. The horizontal axis lists the generations of the simulation so that the use of the different bands can be observed as the species matures. Each colored bar represents the average signal on that band from all messages sent by members of that species in that generation, so the graph overall shows how the species' use of a frequency band changes over the course of the simulation. A number of things are evident from these diagrams. First, note that the signals are initially distributed randomly over the nine available frequency bands. Over the first 50 or so generations, they converge quickly to a smaller subset of those bands. Secondly, there is little overlap between the bands that each species eventually settles on using. By generation 100, species A settles on the use of bands 0, 2, and 4, and continues to use those throughout the simulation. For a number of generations, it adds signals on bands 3 and 8, but eventually drops those channels from its vocalizations. Species B converges to the use of channels 1, 5, and 7 by generation 100, and rarely adds anything more to the sounds it produces. Note that with the exception of species B's use of channel 4 for a few generations towards the end of the simulation, the species rarely encroach on each other's established channels. In fact, the emergent use of channel 2 by species A occurs only after species B abandons that channel almost entirely. This plot demonstrates the differentiation of acoustic niches quite nicely. After relatively few generations, each species settles into its own subset of the available acoustic space, driven by a system that rewards the ability to identify the sender and the message. Another way of visualizing and analyzing these data are as clusters. This image sequence uses T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or T-SNE, to reduce the dimensionality of the vocalizations in each generation. The messages are shown on scatter plots so that we can see the overlap between messages from the different species. In this video, we can observe the messages rapidly going from overlapping in the first generation to relatively well separated by species. As the simulation progresses, vocalizations within a species begin to separate into smaller clusters, reflecting the divergence of the eight different messages that each species is sending. But these are just the results for one of the 40 simulations that were run. What does the broader study show? In order to statistically analyze the entire set of simulations, we used a clustering metric to determine how vocalizations from the two species were grouped in each generation. The silhouette score was developed to measure the validity of clusters in unsupervised clustering algorithms and reflects the density of the clusters within a dataset. A silhouette score of 0 reflects poor clustering with overlapping data, and a score of 1 means that the data are well separated into distinct groups. The chart here shows the silhouette scores for all 40 runs of the simulation. 20 where the receivers were rewarded for identifying the sender, and 20 where it was assumed that the receivers already knew the species of the sender and were therefore not rewarded. The darker gray line shows the average and standard deviation of the silhouette scores in the alternative hypothesis scenario, where receivers had to identify the species of the sender. The lighter gray line shows the same statistics for the simulations where there was no need to identify the sender. The pink line shows an example from the simulations of the alternate hypothesis, with the dots indicating which specific generations are plotted above.
The alternative hypothesis predicts that the simulations in which receivers have to identify the species of the sender should result in more separation between the signals of the two species. Therefore, they should form more distinct clusters and have a significantly higher silhouette score. On the other hand, the null hypothesis expects no significant difference in the silhouette score between the two sets of simulations. As you can see in the chart, the silhouette scores in the scenario where the receivers had to identify the sender are quite a bit higher than those where identification was not necessary. We found a significant difference between the two scenarios in every generation from the fifth onwards at a p-value of less than 0.01. This confirms the alternative hypothesis that the need to identify the species of the sender of a message helps to drive the differentiation of vocalizations within the simulation. I just wanted to note at this point that a similar image appears in our published paper. However, in that image we had inadvertently plotted clusters from a different run of the simulation in the five plots above the silhouette graph. The error in no way changes the results of the paper, but a corrected version has been posted at Archive and is linked at the end of this presentation. What does all of this mean for the acoustic niche hypothesis? The simulation that we've conducted shows that in a highly simplified system, differentiation in the frequency spectrum used by different species can be driven by sexual selection. Of course, our simulation did not attempt to eliminate or test other drivers of differentiation, so at best, we can say that the theories proposed by Krauss and Endler are plausible. We have also demonstrated a relatively rapid way of testing the plausibility of these theories, and this is what we are excited about exploring in future work. We have begun to work on testing the response of these systems to the addition of static noise to the available frequencies. We are also interested in what happens as more species use the acoustic space and the soundscape becomes saturated with messages. What we learn from these simulations will help to drive and interpret the results of a parallel project in which we are designing an autonomous sound producing agent that will inhabit an existing physical ecosystem. We are trying through simulation to gain a prior understanding of how the agent will impact the existing soundscape as it attempts to find and occupy its own niche within a living acoustic ecosystem.